There's a pomposity to film sets. Yeah, get them into the works. I'm like, what does that mean? Oh, hair and makeup. The, uh, yeah, they're traveling. Copy that. Copy that. No, you're not in the military. You're not in the army. Uh, that 10-1. 10-1 is going to the bathroom. Say I'm going to the bathroom. I gotta go to the bathroom. There's no shame in that. We all do it. Hi, I'm Seth MacFarlane, and these are my iconic characters. <music> Family Guy. Life of Larry was a student film that I had done at the Rhode Island School of Design, and I had conceived that to be a pilot that would get me to Hollywood. Hanna-Barbera saw that film and gave me a job. Worked on a show called Johnny Bravo. Worked on a show called Dexter's Lab, Cow and Chicken. Did a, a, a pitch for a primetime animated series called Family Guy. Developed it while I was at Hanna-Barbera slash Cartoon Network. Came to the attention of, of Fox. Pitched the show. They gave me like a $40,000 budget. Uh, to do the pilot, which meant I pretty much had to do it by hand. So I spent six months doing that, and that eventually became became Family Guy. Ooh, you got some pie, eh? Can I have a piece? Uh, sure. Ooh, let me have some of that Cool Whip. What'd you say? You can't have a pie without Cool Whip. Cool Whip? Cool Whip, yeah. You mean Cool Whip? Yeah, Cool Whip. Who are the Griffins? Well, I'm not sure who they are now, but <laughs> when I was there, the family was always designed to be a very region-specific I had just graduated from college uh, in Providence, and so I was very familiar familiar with that region. It was in many ways like a mini Boston. The dialect was more or less the same. It's a ridiculous part of the country in a lot of ways. The dialect is, and you know, I have members of my family who have it, but it's hilarious when employed in, in, in the interest of comedy. These characters were, they all came from different places. I mean, Peter and Brian were very much vaudevillian opposites of each other. Well, Peter, you might be underestimating the difficulty of writing a comic strip. As someone who occasionally dates the creative muse, I can vouch for the unforgiving face of a blank sheet of paper. In fact, I think it was William Faulkner who said, I'm back. I'm published. Check it out. Lois began very much as an avatar for my aunt. She became something very different, uh, mostly thanks to Alex Borstein. You know, Meg and Chris are the, the, the quintessential animated kids. Stewie was Rex Harrison, the character actor from the 1960s and 50s and 60s. It was Henry Higgins. There, there, there. Who's hurting you, you silly girl? What'd you take me for? I thought this was going to be a lawn party. I don't have one pair of long pants. Generally, for me, the voices came first. Peter was a mixture of a lot of different, you know, voices. There was a security guard that worked at the Rhode Island School of Design who had this really, really thick, really expressive Rhode Island accent. Boy, you guys are not sucking me into the story at all. I'm, I'm just telling you for your own benefit, I'm, I'm very aware that I'm watching a play right now. Quagmire started off as throwback to this, you know, this guy whose house looked like, you know, something out of a Peter Sellers movie. And that voice kind of came from um, me listening to old radio dramas from the 50s. When I, there was a bookstore in my hometown when I was a kid, and you could go in and they sold audio tapes, you know, things like The Lone Ranger or Suspense or The Shadow. And the commercials were so, just so absurd and just, you know, everybody talked like this. And it was just, you know, that sort of mid-Atlantic, I guess, existed right in the pocket that the microphones of that time could handle. The low end wasn't there yet. And, and so it was all about, all about mid-range. Oh, hey, uh... Didn't think I'd see anyone I knew here. There's no Daniel Day-Lewis process that goes on here with these kids. <laughs> it's, not, it's not that deep. There are certain facial contortions that, you know, you do Stewie and this happens, and I do Peter and this happens. It's, 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 a little, it's a little bit of that. I've been doing all those characters for so long that it, it really is just a, it's like turning one light off and another one on. Where did the inspiration to do animation come from? I mean, all those things were influences. All in the Family was an influence. The Twilight Zone, Star Trek, obviously. What Disney was doing at the time was a huge influence. When I was in college, Disney was kind of having its second golden age with Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, and Aladdin and those movies. And everyone in, in our film department, in, in the animation division, kind of saw that as the ultimate goal. It's like to work for Disney would be, the, would be you know, and now act technically I do. So that, that was kind of what I was, what I was really striving for. I was doing stand-up at the same time. The Simpsons started to take off. And that, that altered my trajectory because I was really loving doing stand-up, but obviously that wasn't the kind of comedy I'd be doing if I worked for Disney. I started to kind of rethink things. and thought, they've kind of rewritten the rule book. Suddenly I'm watching a cartoon that actually is making me laugh. It's for me as an adult. This changes the game. These, these, you know, the kind of humor that makes me laugh and the stuff that I was doing in my stand-up routines 
could now maybe meld with animation. And so that, that show was instrumental in altering my, my trajectory. And I'm sure the trajectories of a lot of other people who are in the business. I mean, you know, from King of the Hill to Bob's Burgers to South Park, you know, all those shows owe their existence, I think, and in, in they're their, in many ways, their stylistic paradigm to The Simpsons. The thing I liked about animation was that it gave me the chance to explore a lot of different art forms that interested me and had interested me throughout the course of my life all in one package. Animation is, is and I don't know that any, any other medium can really say that, it's visual art, it's performance art, the voiceover, um, it's writing, and it's music. All of those things exist in this one package. There's always a different art form to play with in, in that medium. That's what excited me the most. Time to terrorize the terrorists. Ugh, you prepared catchphrases for yourself? No, not necessarily. To me, the catchphrases are the least interesting things. They, they kind of find you as opposed to the reverse. There was a guy I worked with at Hanna-Barbera. He was a very business-minded uh, writer. And he, he said, you know, never underestimate the importance of a catchphrase. It is something that really makes a difference. It's not something that I set out to do. You, like you, you, you do it, people laugh at the table read, so you add it in next week, and then suddenly you have a catchphrase. Honey, your hands are filthy. Go wash up for lunch. Eat my shorts. Eat my shorts. I love that. Is that a popular expression? Like what the deuce? Probably more popular. Probably, probably way more popular. A uh, stand-up comic friend of mine named Steve Marmel I guess he was a Jerry Lewis fan or something. <laughs> you know, he would he would say, "Hey, Gogan," and I'd be like, "Oh, Gogi," and you know, so it 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 devolved into this giggity giggity, this kind of lazy, um, just distilling of of Jerry Lewis nonsense that uh, that then became giggity giggity giggity. They come from weird places. Giggity. Ted. Ted was conceived as actually as an animated series. That it was it was the same idea. It was a guy who had had a teddy bear who had come to life when he was a kid, and now he still had to deal with it. The thing was still around. But now it was like he had a wife and kids, and, and there was a whole family component. It kind of went out the window when we had the thought of maybe doing this as a film. I had thought at one point, is this a hand puppet thing? Is it like a Greg the Bunny sort of situation? I wrote the... Um, the initial story, and then uh, co-wrote the, the screenplay with Alex Sulkin and, and Wellesley Wild. I think we pitched it to 20th Century Fox. They asked us, can you do a PG-13 version? So we went, we wrote a PG-13 version. I think at the end of the day, they just felt like this is just too expensive, it's too weird, it's too risky. There's, there's a CGI bear at the center of this. It's gonna cost a lot of money, which they weren't wrong. So we took it to Universal, who luckily wanted to do it and wanted to do the R-rated version. You're in one room with with a bunch of suits who don't see it and another room with a bunch of suits who do. Luckily, we landed in, in the right room. It was a pretty simple story in, in a lot of ways. It was, it was something that you know came out, obviously, my, my background in animation, but there was a movie called Alien Nation with uh, Mandy Patinkin that was about an alien invasion, but it actually took place five years after the aliens had invaded, so now they're like, we all kind of work together, and that, that was a, oddly an influence um, when it came to Ted. It's like, okay, well, we all know the, the magical fairy tale story of the thing that comes to life. What's the story that takes place, you know, 30 years later? And the Muppets were a, were a big influence. What I always loved about the Muppets is that there wasn't, there was no gimmick. There was never any, the animals can talk, but only this, you know, they can only talk to each other. I think the second Muppet movie opened with like, you know, Kermit and Fozzie are working at a newspaper. The world you've created is the world where these things can talk and they're part of our community. It's not, oh my God, that frog can talk. It's that frog just cut me off in traffic. If you look at a movie like Ghostbusters, it's like you get one crazy out there thing and everything else has to be really real. And their thing was, okay, there are ghosts running around Manhattan. Everything else has to be grounded. It's New York City as we know it. These guys are basically bug exterminators who happen to catch ghosts. Everything else is, is about that world is real, except for this one thing. Like if the teddy bears come to life, everything else has to be really grounded and normal. Like this is not a fantasy world we're living in. This is Boston. It's two guys sitting on the couch talking about absolutely inconsequential stuff. I mean, but do you think she might be expecting me to make that kind of a move? No, no, I don't think she's, and, and not only that, it's the wrong time. It's a terrible idea. I mean, you got the economy, you got the, the credit bubble, the Supreme Court. I mean, look at Haiti. Yeah, well, I guess I didn't think about that. That's... Yeah, well, that's, you know, it's a factor. I mean, it's interesting. We're, we're doing a TED series now for, for Peacock and Initially, it's like, all right, this is a 22-minute series. To do these moments that have nothing to do with the story, 
but are just real asides that are so much a part of what the movie was. You know, it's, we're having to kind of rethink how we're doing this, how we structure it. It's one of those things in comedy that's, that's strange, is that things that don't move the story forward are not always things you want to pull out. It illustrates who these people are and not what situation they're in at the moment. American Dad. American Dad was a direct response to the political climate at the time. It was, you know, it was immediate post 9-11. The terrorists are everywhere and be on alert. And, you know, that was Stan's whole character. I don't know if I can stand watch all night. You've kept me up for the past two days practicing singing. Steve, this is an opportunity to step up and be a hero. Then you'll know what it takes to really sing our national anthem. Radio me if you have any problems. I'll do my best, Dad. I want more than your best, Steve. For once, I want you to do fine. Roger was, it was the damage that comes with having that job. Like, I gotta house an alien. You guys thought I tried to kill you? Hilarious! <laughs> it's, it's so therapeutic to laugh. You know, we wouldn't have created that show if Family Guy hadn't been canceled. I didn't set out to create two animated shows and have them. I'm, I'm very much somebody who likes to work on one thing at a time, see it through to the finish, and then start on something else. They were all in the same building. I was running back and forth all day, every day, dealing with these two shows, and I, I didn't really feel like I was really running either one. And so I, I made the choice to delegate it to Mike Barker and Matt Weitzman, who I'd co-created it with, and go back and continue nurturing family guy because we hadn't been back from cancellation all that long. In many ways I'm I'm surprised. When I talk to like people in their twenties today, they almost know more about it than I do. How to keep it fresh is always the concern. I mean I, I, I I'm not in the writer's room. I haven't been in the writer's room for about ten years. Do you have a favorite character? I don't I don't really have I mean at this stage, you know, Brian is the easiest character to voice. Stewie certainly is is, you know, at the top of that list. Whatever was in my head that day was you know, is still paying for my house. But, you know, I look at a character like Roger, and that character is kind of mushroomed into something very different, probably not what I would have done, but people love it. There's no word to describe it. Schmoobly dong? That's not it, but it's close. You can create a character, but other writers might be able to do something more interesting with it. And I think you see that all over television. Brian and Stewie is a good example. There's a writer, Gary Gennetti, and the Brian Stewie relationship, which is now so central to that show, was something that he really hit upon. It can be good and, and, and bad to have a show go this long. I think Family Guy in a lot of ways has consistent ups and downs. I'm not gonna be the one to kill it at this point. A Million Ways to Die in the West. I mean, every Western we've ever seen centers around some paragon of nobility and heroism, and most of us aren't like that. Most of us are not, are not, uh, you know, in the gladiatorial arena, we're going like, look at that guy's haircut, huh? That's never who the movie's about. And that's who the, the, the Million Ways to Die in the West was about. It was, it, was, it was about the person who has a strong sense of self-preservation, as most of us do. <laughs> what is there to live for on the frontier in 1882? Huh? But, let me tell you something. We live in a terrible place in time. The American West is a disgusting, awful, dirty, dangerous place. Look around you. Everything out here that's not you wants to kill you. Outlaws, angry drunk people, scorned hookers, hungry animals, diseases, major and minor injuries, Indians, the weather. You, you can get killed just going to the bathroom. I take my life in my hands every time I walk out to my outhouse. The West is so glamorized. It's so romanticized. It would have been terrible to live there. You know, there's, there's like probably one restaurant. You probably live miles and miles and miles away from town. You gotta ride a horse to get there. Even when you do, there's not that much to do. You can go into the saloon, but it's full of assholes you know, where they're drinking in the middle of the day, probably no ice. But you go home and then you just wait for it to get dark and read the Bible. Like, what? There's, there's nothing to do. But Hollywood has been telling us from years, and oh, it's this glorious, romantic, epic, and you know, era in history. And again, I was, we were just trying to take a spin on something familiar that, that hadn't really been explored before. When I did TED, that was my first foray into live action ever. I mean, I'd come out of animation where you plan everything, every shot, you storyboard everything. You can't do coverage. You can't have a wide shot and a tight shot and an over. And I had, in, in my mind, and sometimes on paper, storyboarded every scene. Thinking, all right, we need this shot and this shot and that's it, moving on. And my, my producer really had to explain to me that you should probably get some other angles in case you want to mess with it in, 
you know, in post. And I, I scoffed at it at the time because I had done nothing but animation. I mean, I was asking my director of photography quietly, you know, what's an over, what's a 50-50, these terms that as a director, like, yeah, you should probably know. It was a smart crew and it was an experienced crew and they, they knew that I was very green, but they also knew that I had a clear sense of what I wanted this to be and that I was ready to accept help. As far as the on-camera part of it, Ted itself was not that much of a departure from animation. It was, you know, the physicality was the same as that you do in the booth when you're recording an animated character. The Western was, was easily the most challenging transition because it's a little more dishonest voiceover work. When you're on camera, it's just, you, you, there's less of that. It has to be, it's so much more nuanced. In many, in many ways, it was about pulling back. To this day, it, it is. Even with the Orville, it's about pulling back. It's about, you don't have to give as much, that less is more. The Orville. With the Orville, I really wanted to, I, I've been a fan of sci-fi for, for, since I was a kid. I love that genre of storytelling. The thing that you can do as a writer where you're commenting on something without actually commenting on it, you can take a, a stance, the popular stance or an unpopular stance, and, and tell it through the lens of this alien culture and, and explore alternative viewpoints. It's a lot headier when you're working in that genre, and I, I really wanted to take advantage of that. So the, the Orville began as something that was kind of existing between two worlds. I think I found pretty early on that there, I was much more attracted to one world than the other that I, I didn't mind you know, writing the jokes, but I really wanted to tell the sci-fi stories. About midway through season two, or maybe a little earlier, and certainly in season three, which is coming up in June, um, we kind of cracked the nut of like, okay, there is a humorous component to this. There is a loose component, but the humor is much more character-based. You know, if you're watching Ally McBeal, <laughs> you know, if you're watching Gilmore Girls, the humor comes from who the people are and not from the hard jokes that you would get from a sitcom. Let me see that shoulder. Does it hurt? Yeah, it hurts like hell. That means it's not that bad. What are you talking about, Kelly? I literally just said it hurts like hell. When he's really in pain, he gives straight answers with no cussing. He's just hoping you give him drugs. It's a bunch of crap, Kelly. I'm in real pain here. I, why, do you have drugs? Similar to Albert, I wanted Ed to be somebody who was a little bit more like somebody who might be watching a show like this as opposed to being in it. You know, I watch, I watch a Picard and I'm a fan, but I, don't, I can't relate to Picard because that's not what I would do in that scenario. I'd, I'd be like, yeah, call me when it's over. I, I've written that character in sync with how my, my own journey has felt to me. This ship is what I've been waiting for my entire career. I've gotten more comfortable being on camera. I've gotten more comfortable directing, more comfortable with the world of live action filmmaking. And, and I've tried to kind of translate it, that into the character so the character evolves. He becomes more comfortable in his job. He's a little bit more settled into his chair. It's a character that, that is very different as we, as we go from season to season than he was early on, which is kind of a first. It's, it's you know, with the animated shows, People just stay the same. They're frozen in time. With a movie, you're there for an hour and a half and you're gone. This is kind of the first time I've had the opportunity to really develop characters over the course of, of a long stretch of time. And not just Ed, all the characters. I mean, there, there are nine regulars on that show. It's definitely where I've felt the most relaxed and at ease. And the Orville might be the most fulfilling experience I've had since I've been in Hollywood.